wonderful melody in my, in my day. So inspiring, Dr. Joe. Um, and I, I think you heard me say before that during the sermon, the pastor walked in, we stood because it was so inspiring. I hope you do that for Reverend Walls. You stand when he enters the uh, meeting house? Good. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure this morning is to introduce you to a young man who was an American Revolution hero. But I knew him when he was a small baby. I remember him being baptized in our church. But the Lord was good to him, and he survived the American Revolution with a few scars, I must say. But I'll tell you a little bit about that now. Let me introduce to you Ebenezer Coe. Thank you. You remember me being baptized? I don't remember me being baptized. Or for the last day. Well, I don't remember being baptized, but I do remember looking up at the great second church and then the third church when it was built. Up there on the hill, back then there weren't all those trees there, and we built a great tall church. I remember as a boy thinking it was the tallest thing in the world. It was amazing, much taller and much higher in the air than the Episcopal Church with their golden rooster on top of their stick Yeah. Then, uh, many years later, when I was uh, older, the deacon of this church, God saw fit to strike that church with lightning and burned it to the ground. So we thought it was prudent to come off the hill. <laughs> and I remember the pastor, he took a great stake and he came down here on Main Street, just up the street here, and drove the stake in the ground and he said, where I drive this, there the church shall be built. And there it was built. I remember that church had a great steeple and we had our own booster on the top too. Beautiful church it was had great box pews with doors, which naturally was a useful source of revenue from the church. We, the deacons and the trustees, were very happy about that. As for me, in my long life of 85 years, I was born in 35, it would be uh, 1735. And I remember as a young man growing up, admiring so many things in this town. We had that great church up on the hill. The church could be seen for miles around because there were no trees, there was nothing else. And you could see that tree out to sea, out on the sound for quite a ways. Mariners used to use it as a waypoint to be able to get between Bridgeport and New Haven. Well, Long about uh, oh, 64 or so, the French started making trouble for us and enlisted the Indians and began a campaign that I guess has come to be called the French and Indian War over here. Well, naturally, we all were involved. At the time, His Majesty sent his soldiers to us to help us and to protect us. That was the theory. And they came down, and we uh, were supposed to be paid by the Connecticut Assembly for uh, the privilege of quartering these soldiers, which is to have them in our houses. Well, I'll tell you, there was no money that they could give us. It would be enough for the annoyance. There was no recompense that would be sufficient for, the, for us having to house these ruffians, these soldiers. They came into our community and accosted our women. They took our food and our wood and we had to give them water. They even took Pastor Redmore's house, kicked him out in the street. He had 
can't stay with other members of our community while they were here. And for the privilege, we had to pay 470 pounds and more. Well, it was a great annoyance, I can tell you. But the French were a greater annoyance, and we were very concerned about them. And so a number of us, and our men, we joined the militia and went in, up with the British to Quebec and to Montreal. And there we helped to rout the French and drove them from the Americas. Well, when that happened, we had no more foreign enemies to fight, and we thought we'd come back to a peaceful, peaceful town. No. You see, fighting long foreign wars is very expensive, and the English were determined to make up some of that expense, and they made it up on our backs. It wasn't long before we, in addition to having to keep these soldiers, and we did have to keep these soldiers for a considerable time. We had tax after tax after tax. We had the Stamp Act, the Navigation Act, the Molasses Act. Act after act. All without our representation, without our say. Well, a number of us weren't having that anymore. When, in April 1775, we heard about the news from Lexington and Concord of the terrible uh, actions of the British and the uh, wonderful heroes driving them back to Boston, this town went on fire. And a number of us immediately enlisted with the militia and went to, and went to Fort Ticonderoga. State New York, where we helped to drive the British out of that fort. And when he came back, when we came back, this town was ribbon. It was torn asunder because we had some people who were on one side of the debate, if you could call it a debate. And they were loyalists. They were Tories, we called them. Generally, they were wealthy landowners who didn't want to see change. And then, on the other side, you had us, the Patriots, the Whigs. Now, I think we came out better in the end. Well, I remember clearly uh, George Washington with the Continental Army bringing, coming through and taking the ferry right here across the Potomac. I remember that quite clearly. Alice, you remember that. So, it wasn't too long after that that uh, General Washington went to Boston and he laid siege to the British. The British could break the siege and he left Boston and decided to try for New York. Well, we weren't having any of that. And I went to go and I, with my brothers and my friends and we went to go fight in the Battle of Long Island where I was captured and put in one of the great prison ships. And I caught a terrible fever. Sick as I was, though, I managed to take my chance and I escaped to Harlem Heights. There I lay a while, and eventually I came back to town where I recovered my strength. 1777, uh, the British, under, I believe it was, Major General William Tryon, landed in Westport, in Norway, and they marched up to Danbury. And they headed up to Danbury to take uh, control of the Continental Army stores that were stored up there. And so all of Connecticut decided we were going to stop. And we all gathered under our own general, our own general David Worcester, right here from Stratford. He was in command of the whole army of Connecticut. And he came down, and we all went and chased the British up. But we were a little slow. And we couldn't protect the stores of Danbury, and the British sacked and burned. But on their way back, we made them pay for the privilege, I can tell you. We caught up with them, and they caught up with us at Ridgefield, where we fought a great battle and chased them to the sea. Unfortunately, David Worcester fell, and so did I. I was hit with a musket ball, 
right here in my right eye. And it passed through and carried away a piece of my ear. And I laid it as one dead. I thought I had gone to meet my maker. But I woke up rudely being stabbed in the side by a British bayonet. Fortunately, God and my compatriots heard me cry out in my distress and delivered me. And I was brought back here to Stratford to recover. And for my pains and my service, the town gifted me with a good house. And here I stayed and I became a deacon of this church and was happy to see it in its third and fourth incarnations. Well, that's enough about me. I think you'd be more interested now to talk to Alice Thomas, who uh, was fortunate enough to have met the General Washington. I am General Lafayette. Here you are, Alice. Thank you, Captain. Greetings. I was born in 1764 while we were all still English colonists. At that time, it was known as the first great spiritual awakening, as has been mentioned. I was raised to believe that we can have a personal relationship with God, that we don't need the Church of England to intervene for us, and we don't need King George to govern us because we can do it ourselves. These were terribly Currently new ideas. Our Puritan ancestors, unlike the sermons that we had in those days, we were told not just to intellectually agree with our pastors, but to take action, to awake, to make real the world of God that we wanted to see come forth. To bring about positive change in the world, such as freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. In this way, the Great Awakening brought a desire for freedom that made the American Revolution possible. In 1780, when I was just 16, all of these solidified into my life's purpose when I had the great good fortune to meet not only General Washington, but also the Marquis of Lafayette when they dined at my father's tavern, Benjamin's Tavern, over here on Broad Street. I remember that day because not only were we meeting great men, but we had the special treat of having potatoes. <laughs> very rare and very special, so it was a way to honor our great heroes. Stratford was growing rapidly at that time. Many of our neighboring towns are now formed on land that once belonged to Stratford, including Bridgeport, Shelton, Troll, Monroe, and a little bit of Fairfield. I remember um, small mills producing textiles, shoes, and metal goods. Eventually, we would even see a, a train coming into town that was built on land that is now at the rear of our church. You've already heard about the American Revolution in Captain Cove, but in 1812, we went to war again with the British for two and a half years for several reasons, including severe trade restrictions due to the British war with France. The fact that the British were constricting our soldiers at gunpoint to serve in the Royal Navy. And there was also talk of Canada annexing part of British territory I'm sorry, American annexing part of British territory in Canada, but eventually our boundaries did remain the same. By 1840, the Second Great Awakening was a national movement, but it really centered here in New England and upstate New York. Um, we called this area the Burned Over Towns, where hellfire and damnation speeches were very popular. Many new and overlapping ideas came from this, particularly temperance, abolition, and women's rights. Many of our church women had joined the Women's Temperance Christian Organization with the goal of promoting abstinence from alcohol. Abstinence, I'm sorry, alcoholism, as you know, is a terrible disease. It affects not only the personal drinker, but their family and entire communities. Even today, there's no cure for alcoholism except for total abstinence. So this was a major issue in our day. At this point, I'd like to talk for a moment about Reverend Joshua Levitt, who was ordained in our church and who was our pastor for four years after he graduated from Yale Theological Seminary. He went on to become one of the world's, our country's greatest uh, abolitionists. I have here an example of the Emancipator newspaper that he edited for many years. Um, he was the first secretary of the American Temperance Society and co-founder of the New York 
City Anti-Slavery Society. Reverend Levitt was also a lawyer, and he became very involved in anti-slavery uh, uh, cases, including the famous case of Basil Dorsey, who escaped from Maryland into Massachusetts. Then in 1839, he and two others formed a committee to raise money for the defense of West Africans who were held captive on the Spanish slave ship the Amistad. This case went all the way to the Supreme Court, where John Quincy Adams, our sixth U.S. president and then a member of Congress, argued in defense of the slaves. He said, if President Van Buren could hand over free men on the demand of a foreign government, how could any American man, woman, or child ever be sure of their blessings of freedom? The court agreed, and the slaves eventually did find their way back to the West African country today that is known as Nigeria. The Amistad case was a victory for us abolitionists and a watershed moment leading up to the Civil War. In my long life, I live to be nearly 100, I was inspired by the world's first convention for women's rights in Seneca Falls, New York. Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony drafted and distributed the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions, demanding social and political equality for all women, including our most controversial demand, the right to vote. Can you imagine? This is a time of very public debate about reforming the remnants of English common law that we call, we Americans still uh, had on our books. For example, did you know that when a woman is married, she enters a legal tomb? A tomb. In the eyes of law, she becomes one with her husband, and it is said that we women um, enter a legal tomb. Our property is assigned to our husband because everybody knows that the dead can't keep property, and the wife is legally dead. As suffragists, we were mocked and ridiculed, but eventually, liberty and reason did uh, prevail. And now I have the great honor of introducing an amazing woman whose life and work and travels embodied many of the dreams and ambitions of so many of us here at Stratford. She's the daughter of one of my best friends, and I could not be delighted to welcome Miss Cornelia Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. I believe we're going to have a moment uh, of all things. 